One of the many signs of verbal virtuosity among intellectuals is the repackaging of words to mean things that are not only different from, but sometimes the direct opposite of, their original meanings. Freedom and power are among the most common of these repackaged words. The basic concept of freedom as not being subjected to other people's restrictions, and of power as the ability to restrict other people's options, have both been stood on their heads in some of the repackaging of these words by intellectuals discussing economic issues. Thus, business enterprises which expand the public's options, either quantitatively, through lower prices, or qualitatively, through better products, are often spoke of as controlling the market. Whenever this results in a high percentage of consumers choosing to purchase their particular products rather than the competing products of other enterprises. In other words, when consumers decide that particular brands of products are either cheaper or better than competing brands of those products, third parties take it upon themselves to depict those who produced these particular brands as having exercised power or control. If, at a given time, three-quarters of the consumers prefer to buy the Acme brand of widgets to any other brand, then Acme Inc. will be said to control three-quarters of the market, even though consumers control 100% of the market, since they can switch to another brand of widgets tomorrow if someone else comes up with a better widget, or stop buying widgets altogether if a new product comes along that makes widgets obsolete. Any number of companies that have been said to control a majority of their market have not only lost that market share, but have gone bankrupt within a few years of their supposed dominance of the market. Smith Corona, for example, sold over half the typewriters and word processors in the United States in 1989, but just six years later, it filed for bankruptcy, as the spread of personal computers displaced both typewriters and word processors. Yet the verbal packaging of sales statistics ex post as market control ex ante has been common, not only in the writings of the intelligentsia, but even in courts of law and antitrust cases. Even at its peak, Smith Corona controlled nothing. Every consumer was free to buy any other brand of typewriter or word processor, or refrain from buying any. The verbal packaging of consumer choice as business control has become so widespread that few people seem to feel the need to do anything so basic as thinking about the meaning of the words they are using, which transform an ex-post statistic into an ex-ante condition. By saying that businesses have power because they have control of their markets, this verbal virtuosity opens the way to saying that government needs to exercise its countervailing power, John Kenneth Galbraith's phrase, in order to protect the public. Despite the verbal parallels, government power is, in fact, power, since individuals do not have a free choice as to whether or not to obey government laws and regulations, while consumers are free to ignore the products marketed by even the biggest and supposedly most powerful corporations in the world. There are people who have never set foot in a Walmart store, and there is nothing that Walmart can do about it, despite being the world's largest retailer. One of John Kenneth Galbraith's earliest and most influential books, American Capitalism, the Concept of Countervailing Power, declared that power on one side of a market creates both the need for and the prospect of reward to the exercise of countervailing power from the other side. Thus, according to Professor Galbraith, the rise of big corporations gave them an oppressive power over their employees, which led to the creation of labor unions in self-defense. As a matter of historical fact, however, it was not in large mass production industries that American labor unions began, but in industries with numerous smaller businesses, such as construction, trucking, and coal mining, all of which were unionized years before the steel or automobile industries. But whatever the genesis of union power, the crucial countervailing power for Galbraith was that of the government, both in support of private countervailing power with such legislation as the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 and legislation to help coal producers and others supposedly oppressed by the power of big business. Such government countervailing power performs a valuable, indeed an indispensable, regulatory function in the modern economy, according to Galbraith. But this formulation depends crucially on redefining power to include its opposite, the expansion of consumer options by businesses in order to increase sales. John Kenneth Galbraith was perhaps the most prominent and certainly one of the most verbally gifted of the advocates of a theory of volitional pricing. According to Professor Galbraith, the output of a given industry tends to become more concentrated over time in the hands of a few producers who acquire decisive advantages that make it difficult for a new company without the same amount of experience to enter the industry and compete effectively against the leading incumbents. Therefore, according to Galbraith, sellers have gained authority over prices, which are 
tacitly administered by a few large firms. In reality, one of the most common reasons for buyers buying disproportionately from a particular seller is that this seller has a lower price. After Galbraith has redefined power as a concentration of sales and of resulting profits and size, he is able to depict that power of the seller as a reason why that seller can now set prices different from, and implicitly higher than, those of a competitive market. In this formulation, the size of the corporation which the individual heads is again a rough index of the power the individual exercises. However plausible all this might seem, Galbraith did not venture very far in the direction of empirical verification. The insinuation of Galbraith's, and many others, discussions of the power of big business is that the growth of ever larger businesses means the growth of their power to raise prices. This insinuation, as distinguished from either a demonstrated fact or even a testable hypothesis, was a staple among the intelligentsia long before Galbraith's time and provided the impetus for the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, among other attempts to contain the power of big business. In reality, the era leading up to the Sherman Act was not an era of rising prices imposed by monopolies, even though it was an era of growing sizes of businesses in many industries, often through consolidation of smaller businesses into giant corporations. Far from leading to higher prices, however, this was an era of falling prices charged by these larger businesses, whose size created economies of scale, which meant lower production costs that enabled them to profit from lower prices, thereby expanding their sales. Crude oil, which sold for $12 to $16 a barrel in 1860, sold for less than $1 a barrel in every year from 1879 to 1900. Railroad freight costs fell by 1887 to 54% of what they had been in 1873. The price of steel rails fell from $68 in 1880 to $32 in 1890. The prices of sugar, lead, and zinc all fell during this period. Henry Ford pioneered in mass production methods and had some of the highest paid workers of his day, decades before the industry was unionized, and the lowest priced cars, notably the legendary Model T, which made the automobile no longer a luxury confined to the wealthy. But none of these plain facts prevailed against the vision of the progressive era intelligentsia, who in this case included President Theodore Roosevelt. His administration launched antitrust prosecutions against some of the biggest price cutters, including Standard Oil and the Great Northern Railroad. Theodore Roosevelt sought the power, in his words, to control and regulate all big combinations. He declared that, of all forms of tyranny, the least attractive and the most vulgar is the tyranny of mere wealth, the tyranny of a plutocracy. No doubt it was true, as T.R. said, that Standard Oil created enormous fortunes for its owners at the expense of business rivals. But it is questionable whether consumers who paid lower prices for oil felt that they were victims of a tyranny. One of the popular muckraking books of the Progressive Era was The History of the Standard Oil Company by Ida Tarbell, which said, among other things, that Rockefeller should have been satisfied with what he had achieved financially by 1870, implying greed in his continued efforts to increase the size and profitability of Standard Oil. A study done a century later, however, pointed out, one might never know from reading the history of Standard Oil that oil prices were actually falling. That fact had been filtered out of the story. The question whether Rockefeller's pursuit of a larger fortune actually made the consuming public worse off was seldom even addressed. How consumers would have been better off if a man who introduced extraordinary efficiencies into the production and distribution of oil had ended his career earlier, leaving both the cost of producing oil and the resulting prices higher, is a question not raised, much less answered. One of the common complaints against Standard Oil was that it was able to get railroads to charge them less for shipping their oil than was charged to competing businesses shipping oil. Such an inequality was, of course, anathema to those who thought in terms of abstract people in an abstract world, ignoring what there was specifically about Standard Oil that was different, which was the very reason why John D. Rockefeller amassed a fortune in an industry in which many others went bankrupt. Standard Oil's tank cars were easier to transport than oil shipped in barrels by other companies. Yet Theodore Roosevelt, who knew little or no economics and had lost a large portion of his inheritance in his one business venture, said that discount shipping rates were discriminatory and should be forbidden in every shape and form. Senator John Sherman, author of the Sherman Antitrust Act, also introduced legislation to ban differential shipping rates, apparently at the prompting of a refinery that shipped its oil in barrels. 
Businesses which charge lower prices often lead to losses by competing businesses which charge higher prices. But obvious as this might seem, it has not stopped outcries over the years from the intelligentsia, legislation from politicians, and adverse court decisions from judges, aimed not only at Standard Oil in the early 20th century, but also later at other businesses that reduced prices in other industries, ranging from the A&P grocery chain in the past to Microsoft today. In short, the verbal transformation of lower prices and larger sales into an exercise of power by business that has to be counteracted by more government power has more than purely intellectual implications. It has led to many laws, policies, and court decisions that punish lower prices in the name of protecting consumers.